This is the Fit Roots Podcast, and I'm your host, Aidan Lee. We are focused on teaching you the best of philosophy, martial arts, health, well-being, and business. Our mission is to build modern warriors who enhance their lives through continual physical and mental evolution, and then bestow that gift onto the next generation. Today, we've got Phil Byrne joining us. Phil Byrne is an expert in pay-per-click marketing and, web, and a web analytics professional. He is here to help your business find your perfect customers by search and social advertising. He is here to also open your ears to what those perfect customers want from you as they speak to you through your web data. And his famous question is, are you ready to listen? Phil, welcome to the FitRoots podcast. Thank you, Aidan. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for coming on. And uh, for those who don't know, I was actually on Phil's podcast about, we were just discussing two and a, two and a bit years ago. Or two <laughs> two years. So uh, it's interesting that it's come full circle. Absolutely, Aidan. And I was saying to you just before we started, you're actually the first guest who's gone on to present their own podcast. So, so well done you. Well, no, thank you. Um, it was a pleasure being on yours and hopefully you can share and bestow some of your wisdom that you've learned through your journey uh, to our listeners and also bring something back to yourself too. So I'd love to start, Phil, on you've given us that you know, great, great background in your bio, but starting by telling us your journey and how you got to where you are now with your successful business. Sure. Okay. Well, I suppose I got into internet marketing really early. So, you know, I was a student in the kind of mid nineties and I did philosophy at university, which I know you did as well, Aidan, I believe. Yes. And you know that back then, especially it was the kind of degree where there wasn't too many hours, lessons per week. And, um, it was less about coursework in those days. So you had a lot of spare time. There wasn't tuition fees as there are now. It was a very different life as a student. So I used to sort of hang out with bands that I liked and, I'll put on club nights and, and gigs for, for the other university. So I was at Leeds University, but it was the, what was then the Polytechnic down the road. And it was there that I first encountered marketing. And, you know, that was simply putting posters up, putting um, adverts in the local paper to bring people to the events that were running. And then around that time, the internet began to emerge. And because it was so early, I was quite intrigued by it. And I started to make little websites for, for bands, for the events we were running. And, you know, it all grew, grew from there. It was all dial-up access in those days. And we'd spend fortunes on our phone bills trying to connect to the internet. Um, and this was before Google and before Facebook, a long time before Facebook. But, you know, those first steps in, in watching the internet grow from nothing uh, sort of laid the path for everything else. The early days of the internet really were all about um, what's called SEO, search engine optimization. And when Google came along, that's what everybody wanted to be at the top of Google. And that was the first real web marketing service I sold. Uh, that, did, that did pretty good. Uh, and I began to make my own sites at that time, which were largely in the travel industry. And I would do my very best to make them rank for all kinds of keyword searches. Uh, and then the emergence of social media and pay-per-click began to come through. Uh, and and from, you know, from those early days of SEO, I think we've now moved into a much more sophisticated online world. Uh, and pay-per-click for me is the, you know, the most direct way to reach your potential market online. And, and I also believe the best way to scale a business. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's a short description of the journey and uh, you know, where, where I am today, it, it all comes down to just having a go when the internet first emerged, I think. Yeah. And it sounds like you caught it at, at a great moment because obviously a lot of people have come into this industry since, but you caught it mm. at the cusp of before it blew up. How was that in that era doing it then uh, rather than what you see now? Tell us a bit more about your experience around that. Sure. It was so different. It was, you know, the, the, the websites back then were, they were more like really simple, um, words and a background color perhaps not many pictures because the internet wasn't fast enough to download them uh, there was not many people doing it if i when i first set up my first kind of web design company as it was then the phone did not ring no one knew what it was uh, and, and at the same time the first dot com crash happened so you know that kind of further pushed down the 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 whole society's impression of what the internet could be 
and it took a year really for for that to change and for things to start coming through so so then the good side of that happened you know I was one of very very few people who were working online at the time and there was so much space for us and the opportunities came and you know I, I started buying domain names back then uh, so you know all of these things we were lucky in the sense that we were the first ones there and, and that certainly has made a difference I think it'd be so much harder to come into this world now because there is so much competition as you said so many people can do this now so many people perhaps think they can do it as you and I chatted about before we started the podcast and there's also some really fantastic uh, web marketing people all over the place now so the competition is of a much higher level too yeah interesting and you also said on a note earlier uh phil that <coughs> that um internet marketing the way that you you measure so ppc uh, and google adwords maybe is the quickest and most effective way to grow and build business tell mm. us more about that and why that's the case yeah sure so if we imagine that all the other forms of online marketing, so search engine optimization or social media, what we effectively do is we put a message out to people that we hope come across that particular message. The difference with pay-per-click is we can choose who we put the message in front of, and it can happen tomorrow. So search engine optimization can be very, very good for a business, but it takes a long, long time for it to start having an effect. Uh, social media or the organic sense of social media we put a post out there and we hope people encounter it. Uh, Pay-per-click, we can set up a campaign to go out tomorrow to exactly who you want it to go to. And then from, from that impact, so once we start hitting those, that target audience that you're looking for, the data we can collect from pay-per-click lets us see what part of that audience are interacting with your adverts the most positively. And that means we can start to refine your spend. So we can say, okay, let's stop showing it to, to this part of the audience. It might be that we see there's a, a definite gender split on your product or an age split. Maybe people of a certain age interact with it better. And we begin to find where your opportunities are. So this type of person who is watching these kinds of things on YouTube or searching for these kinds of keywords on Google or has these specific interests and connections on Facebook, they are ready to buy what you offer right now. Uh, so we refine that spend down until it's giving you the best return. And all that can happen quite quickly. Um, we, we get to this figure. The key figure in all pay-per-click marketing is something called a CPA, which is a cost per acquisition. So if the cost of you acquiring a new customer is at a level which makes it very profitable for you, then you can then scale your business very quickly. Does that make sense, Aidan? Yeah, if I'm completely with you. I've, as I mentioned earlier, I've had a little bit of experience of, of doing a little bit of uh, PPC marketing myself try, mm. and uh, outsourcing to some agencies which didn't do the best job, but I still got some results from it. Now, I can only imagine what it's like when you really do it properly and have someone like yourself who can do the job as it should be done and, as you say, really measure that key metric, which is that uh, CPA. So Totally. Have yeah, you had absolutely. any experience of um, those who have maybe measured, not measured CPA very well at all, been elsewhere, maybe like myself, and then come to yourself or something like that, measured it and been almost gobsmacked at the, the differences in results? Oh, totally. You know, so you can, probably the best kind of uh, new customer to meet is someone who's doing a lot of activity themselves, but haven't, haven't learned enough perhaps about pay-per-click or web marketing to understand how to best channel that. So, you know, if we're doing Facebook ads, for example, the best thing to find is a, a Facebook page that is regularly updated and has people liking and commenting on posts because all we, all we really need to do is to take that engaged audience and show them a great offer. It's written really well, perhaps has a good incentive uh, and, and give people a great reason to become a customer of a page they already like. That's the best kind of customer to find. Um, so, and then on the other hand, when, when people's targeting is too wide, perhaps, and they're wasting money on people which are never going to buy for them, but they don't know that, to then take that same spend and channel it much better can also have an equally positive effect. So, you know, lots of things come up again and again in paperclip marketing. And when you do it enough times, you, you look for those things right away. Are people remarketing? So remarketing is always one of the most 
um, highly profitable part of pay-per-click. And that's where we show an advert to someone who has been to our website in the past or visited our Facebook page or interacted with a post uh, previously. So those people already know who we are. So to then show those people some kind of great offer, they're going to convert much more powerfully than people who don't know you at all. Interesting. So I guess from my understanding of marketing, that would be having those extra touch points and using that data, and the, as far as I'm aware, the retargeting pixels to help you see those, or those same people see your stuff again. Exactly. And, and, and Aiden, probably the, the secret to great online marketing is giving people the right message at the right time. So if we show people who are brand new to us, some, uh, well, if we're asking them to buy right away, then that's going to have a really low conversion. In the same way, if we met someone at a networking event, and the first thing they say is, hi, I'm Aiden, do you want to buy this? There's a big barrier there. But if, if we get to know that person, and then further down the line, we're looking for what they offer, we think of them. Or if further down the line, they're having some kind of great offer for people who are already connected to them, all of that brand awareness is there. And it's the same in online marketing. We have to engage people. We have to show them what we're great at. And then when they're really connected with us, that is the time to ask them a sales question. So that notion of the right message at the right time is key to it all. Yeah, I've had some experience with that where, you know, if you put something out too soon, it doesn't convert and you wonder why. With that in mind, do you, I assume you're aware of it, but do you follow the ADA formula or things like that? Do you know what that is? Well, you, you, I've not heard of that one. You tell me what that okay. one is. Uh, well, something that one of the other agencies told me about, but I think it's attract, interest, desire, action. Okay. So yeah. some, I'm sure there's other parallels. But yeah, something, sure. do you, what my question then therefore really is, do you follow some sort of principle to get people from stranger to customer? Mm. Right? So, so re really the one that we use, which is another version of that, is we call it brand versus sales. So when we're marketing any business, we look at how well branded they are. Do people know who they are? Are people aware of what they offer? And the people aware, probably the most important part is how they are different in what they offer to everyone else that offers the same thing, that key USP. And if their brand awareness is strong enough, then we can start to sell. And so most businesses are either overbranding or overselling. And when we see beautiful marketing, so when people think of Apple, which is often cited as a great example of effect, their brand is very, very strong. So when their sales messages come, it's hardly even noticed. And it's, it's more like people are so excited to buy their new devices because their connection with the brand is already established. So we have to take the same kind of balance between brand and sales for every business. So, you know, this podcast for you, Aiden, will reach out and touch people and tell them things about you and raise your brand. So people who become podcast listeners are the people most likely to become potential customers. That's very interesting. So with that in mind, then, are you saying there needs to be a fine balance between branding and selling, not too much of one or too much of the other? Totally. And, and one has to come before the other. So brand has to come before selling. Uh, and the only time that, is, is not the case, is if we are price driven. So if we are selling something significantly cheaper than anybody else on the market, we can just go ahead and sell to people because the price saving is the key differential. Mm. But if we're more expensive or if we're the same price say, as our competitors, then what we have to get over are the other things that we do and the other things we're about to differentiate us from the rest of the market. So we have to build our brand before we can, we can start to sell this. There's, a, there's an American phrase from um, a, a cool inbound marketing company called HubSpot, which is marketing. I don't know if you've heard of that before. I've heard of HubSpot and inbound, but uh, could you tell us about that, but also explain what inbound marketing is too, for those who don't know? Sure. So inbound marketing is the notion of creating great pieces of content, great useful resources for your audience and giving them to that audience to then engage them with your brand and company. So you're educating your audience on what you do, why it's good for them, and how it can benefit them. Uh, and so, and marketing is this notion that sales and marketing have to work together. Whereas traditionally, if we go back 
10, 15 years, pre-internet times, or just as the internet was starting. Most businesses were set up as marketing and sales as different departments, which often ended up fighting because sales would be complaining about marketing generating crap leads and marketing would be complaining about sales, demanding that they should get more information at a point that's too early. So when we look at marketing, we're looking at it as one process. How do we take someone who doesn't know anything about us all the way through connection with the brand, all the way to the point at which they will welcome a call rather than be irritated by it? Yeah, because it's all too often that experience of people not wanting to be on the receiving end of it. And if you combine that too into some sort of a holy communion, as you say, it's, uh, it can be very powerful, isn't it? Definitely. And we can only, we think of PPI and, you know, double glazing. These industries have a reputation for overselling. Uh, and then we can also think of, we probably all have friends who are very, very often very creative people over brand and undersell. So photographers, artists, they're, they're, they want to show what they do, but they're often frightened to ask people to buy it. And it's, why, why do you think that is? Because I think it feels wrong sometimes to, to ask for money from people. Uh, and, and especially in the UK, you know, I spent a little bit of time in the US, as you know, and that culture there is far more comfortable with saying, this is what to do and this is what it costs. Whereas we're, our culture is a bit more polite, a bit more reserved. So we almost want to let people make that decision themselves about buying something. Um, but it's, it's usually not ever enough to build a great business, to, to just allow that to happen. There has to be a point at which um, we make the, the, the offer. We say, hey, we got this on this month. It's a limited offer. This is what it costs. We'd love you to be part of it. And becoming comfortable with both sides of this, this balance, becoming comfortable branding and becoming comfortable selling is I think a key part of building a great business. That's definitely something I can take on board and I'm trying to do now as well. So hopefully some of our listeners who are mostly uh, business entrepreneur, entrepreneurial men can do that too. Cause uh, I see a lot of it in the market and even myself where I've not put those two together and there's a bit of a disconnect. You either find you're getting too much and you can't deal with it or you're getting none and you're wondering, well, why aren't I getting anything? So Absolutely. I can see, really see that. You also, also mentioned earlier and uh, we discussed at the start as well about your podcast field. I'd be interested sure. to hear about the Positive uh, Sparks podcast and one, why you started it and how, if you don't mind me saying, grew it to the level that you have now. Because as far as I'm aware, you have about 3,000 uh, listeners. So tell us some more about that. Sure, absolutely. Well, that, that, the podcast for me was a decision about how we were going to promote Positive Sparks as a brand and myself as well, the two together. So back then, that was at a time when inbound marketing, especially content marketing, was really exploding. And, you know, I've always loved words, but I'd rather write a small amount of words, so a great advert or even a poem, let's say, than I would an essay or an article. So I began to think about this and I'd, I was beginning to listen to podcasts and I thought, that's what I want to do. I love chatting with people and learning about them and, and sharing great things that we both know and how they seen how they bounce off each other. Uh, I, I used to have a, a, well, I love a music. I still do, but I used to spend a bit of time in recording studios. I've always loved recording audio uh, and it just seemed a great move for me. And, and it, you know, the great thing I'd say about it for me is that I enjoy it. I, I look forward to the podcast every week. I love having chats with people. I'm enjoying this one now, Aidan. <laughs> and it, it's so much more, natural to me than writing content articles it's also a little different perhaps as well less people have a podcast as they do a blog yeah so um, it takes more effort doesn't it as well but yeah um i mean i'm only just starting out but i'm already seeing the rewards from it and just that extra bit of satisfaction that as you say there i think you don't quite get necessarily from a blog that you can get from a more human uh, conversation totally Exactly Brilliant. right. And, uh, and, and I, I think you're going to do well with yours too. Well, I appreciate it. And hopefully let's see, what, I can emulate your success. So let's see what happens. But tell us a bit about how you grew your podcast too. Because, you know, 3,000 monthly listeners is quite substantial. I mean, tell us mm. about how you grew to that. And also, you know, what your aims with the podcast are going forwards. 
Sure. Well, it all began with our email list. So we'd acquired, you know, quite a good email list over the years. Um, I've probably been a web marketer for quite a long time because the podcast is only two and a half years old. Uh, so I, I got a good email list um, from all of the things I'd done in online marketing. So that's where it started. Um, I had a pretty good Twitter account, which had quite a few followers too, and that helped. Uh, but then from there, the thing that really helps Aiden are the guests because the guests also have their communities and they, they are usually excited that they've done a podcast and, and most of the time it goes really well. So they'll share it with their communities as well. And, and as you do more and more, this just builds up. You know, like anything that we invest timing, it, 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 it takes time to grow. But if we keep doing it consistently, it, it begins to maneuver and, and go from there. Um, you know, we, we used to do a, a weekly email newsletter to everybody on our list, which would feature the podcast, a web marketing tip, and then other things that we read online, you know, this kind of three-touch format. Uh, beyond there, we, we've tried other things as well. So we've done some uh, marketing on things like Outbrain, and if you're aware of that, uh, which is a content sharing advertising platform. So what it will do is it will place episodes of your podcast as links on different sites across the internet, which you can select. Uh, we've done quite a lot of Facebook ads, which has really helped. Uh, we, we can target the people who listen to our podcast, which tends to be people working online, either from home or remotely. We have a lot of expats who work online that listen to the podcast uh, or, or marketing people in companies. So all these people we can target. Uh, we share it on LinkedIn. That is actually beginning to become more powerful for us as LinkedIn evolves and changes. And any new advertising platform that we see will often try the podcast as a, a test campaign just so we could learn about the, the platform itself. So, um, so one for you to look at, actually, Aiden, is one of our podcast guests from about a year ago. It's called Q. So it's Q-U-U-U, three U's. <laughs> and, and what they do is they take good podcasts and good articles, any kind of great content, and they'll distribute it around the social media web to people who are connected with a topic that the podcast might cover. So in your sense, it could be, you know, men's psychology, men's philosophy, men's healthy living. For us, it's web marketing, online productivity, online entrepreneurship. And we found we get quite a lot of shares from Q. Interesting. So you can upload your content and they'll distribute it for you and to your, almost to your target market, it sounds like. Yeah, definitely. So it's, it's actually only a link is what you need. So you, you give them a link to the podcast, you write a, a, a quick tweet and a quick Facebook post for them. And then off they send it, tell them who you want it to go to, they review it so that, you know, they don't say yes to everything. Um, but anything which is not 100% about promotion, they tend to be okay with. Uh, as long as it's useful to the audience, off it goes. Then, and then the great thing is the people who share it choose to share it. That They don't have to share it. They are offered it. They assess it. And so when you see those tweets coming through, it's genuine. It's people who actually want to share that content with their people. Interesting. I'll definitely check it out. I have a feeling I'm already signed up to because I've definitely heard of them before and looked into mm. it, but I didn't really do it deeply. But you've reinvigorated that, so <laughs> do that. thank you. I'm interested, Phil, into seeing how you tie the two together. So you've told us about, obviously, Positive Sparks, the marketing agency, and then Positive Sparks, the podcast. And you've said briefly upon that, but how do you tie them together and how has that benefited you? As in the company and the podcast itself? Yes. Yeah. Um, I think it, it raises the profile of Positive Sparks. It raises the profile of myself. Uh, the podcast, without doubt, stretches out into areas that go way beyond what positive sparks do, but that's, that's fine. You know, it's, it becomes more, you know, I, I'm a real believer in digital living. I think the internet has enhanced all our lives, whether we know it or not. Uh, and, and anything that celebrates that I'll probably cover on the podcast. Whereas positive sparks is, is more defined in what it offers. I think a business has to be, we have to say, this is what we do. And, you know, I would rather, and we strive to be, exceptional at pay-per-click and web data rather than being just okay at lots of things which lots of other agencies do so they'll offer a full service solution and and i've never really been into that i think it's better to be great at something rather than than kind of 
just okay, as I was saying, at many things. So the podcast allows me to go beyond just what we do in Positive Sparks, which being a curious person, Aiden, is good for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, with your, which actually brings me on to my next topic about uh, your experience in philosophy is that obviously if you have that curiosity, the remit of your agency allows you to stay within your remit, but then the podcast allows you to explore that as and when you feel necessary. I mean, even when we first mm-hmm. spoke, I wasn't, uh, from what I remember, the most ne- uh, vital fit to your show because digital marketing, health, fitness, you know, how do you combine that? Uh, but we found an angle and it, it seemed to work. So I can see how you're exploring a lot of different things and how that's helpful to one, grow your podcast, but two, also your agency. So Definitely. with that in mind, Phil, tell us, uh, I'd be interested really to hear about your background in philosophy and if at all it has helped you, one, why you chose it, if at all has helped you and, and what you do with it now, if anything. Sure. I think, you know, when I chose to go to university and do philosophy, I actually started out doing business studies. And, and that was the path that, you know, it was more acceptable at the time. You know, the, the, I was from quite a poor area and that jump into business studies seemed to make the most economic sense as well. But when I'd, I'd sort of left home to do business studies and started that and then thought, nah, this isn't for me. Ironically, I run a business now. <laughs> but back then, you know, 18 years old, it was different. And I'd always been curious about the human condition and, and why the world is as it is. So that's what drew me into philosophy. And uh, making that jump definitely let me learn lots of things that I'd never encountered at school. I didn't go to a great school. It was, we used to have league tables for school back in those days. And mine was always near the bottom. Um, so, you know, th- those kinds of topics were never available there. Uh, so I encountered things like the Greek philosophers and Descartes and then some of the more 20th century philosophers like Nietzsche and uh, the existentialists. And all this was great for me to absorb. Uh, and and, and what, where do I learn from it now? I think it's just made me a, a person who wants to hear everyone's opinion, wants to hear everyone's ideas and decide for himself which ones work for, for, for me, all in all. It's left me that curiosity. It's also meant that I've never, ever quite walked the, the career path and, and the, the, the simple straight line that perhaps many people do live, and, and it's good for them perhaps. You know, they, they live a similar life to their friends. That's never quite been for me, and uh, that's meant I've lived in a few places and tried lots of things in my um, online business life, even though it's all defined by the internet. I, I just love trying new things. So I think it touches that part of me as a person. And in business, I, I also believe it's important for us to be ethical, treat people as we want to be treated, to make the world a better place. And somehow that connects with that part of me too. Yeah, I can see that for sure in how you conduct yourself in your business. And uh, even for myself too, philosophy has been so fundamental as to how I've structured my my thoughts, the business itself, you know, the direction, the path. And, you know, in my, my line of business, you could argue it's a bit more tangible, but even in your mm. area, you can really see how you're, that's leading to you being curious, being ethical, moral about how you conduct yourself. So it's really interesting to see that even though that was quite a while back, those lessons are still mm. playing out with you now. Totally. How old are you, Aidan, if you don't mind me asking? Not at all. 26. 26. So you see, when I was doing philosophy, you were just born you're about a year old oh my god <laughs> <laughs> there we go a long time yeah. ago but, yeah, uh, but i didn't realize it was that long ago, actually it's a long time you know yeah. but but you're right you know all those one, one thing that's great for me now is it feels like the world the business world it's hard to say the world because that's a different thing we have some strange political leaders now but we we seem to have a business community that's more focused on making the world a better place and that that's massively positive I don't think it was like that when I first started a business. Yeah, I can imagine it was a bit more money, money. But now, I think especially in the internet marketing world, I think there's obviously there are some um, particularly dodgy people as with any industry. But I think mm. you guys, so you have a focus on uh, really trying to elevate businesses to help them serve more people. And I've seen that mission kind of coming out a lot more. Totally. Yeah, it's a great thing. And, and all these wonderful young, talented app creators. I just think 
you know, that they're having such a great effect on the world. If they create an app that is beneficial to many, many people, then that's a power and a potential that they have that I didn't have when I was their age. So I wonder, as you know, Aiden, I've just had a son. What opportunities lay in the world for him when he gets to be 18, 20, 21, whatever? There's just so much more impact we can have on people because of the online world. And that, that's, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, even right now, I feel the, the opportunity is so phenomenal, let alone when, when your son is, you know, my age, as you say, 18 or whatever. Um, you've almost got like three generations there. It's uh, <laughs> going to be a very interesting difference even between what uh, me and him experienced. So on that note, Phil, you've, as you said, you've just recently become a, a father. And um, tell us how that's affected you and your, your thoughts, your perceptions, your business, your life as a whole. But it's had a dramatic effect, as you can imagine. And it's hard to explain. So, so when, when, you know, my, my wife and I were pregnant, you have excitement and ideas in your head about how it's going to be. There's, there's just nothing that can prepare you for this. Uh, and one of, one of my friends is, is about to have a baby now. And it doesn't matter what conversations we have. I can see in his eyes, he's got no idea what's coming. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't. So it is, it is a huge life change, but it is a hugely positive life change. And suddenly, you know, being home at a certain time matters a lot to me. And it's not like I didn't want to be at home in the past. It's just that my time, because I'm working every day, my time with my son is every day is limited because I leave the house and I come back. And that becomes hugely important to you. And, and just watching a person grow out of, you know, your baby, is, is a beautiful thing. It really is. It, it makes you look at everything in the world in a different way. So a beautiful day is suddenly more beautiful because it's not just beautiful for you, it's beautiful for your son as well, in my case. Uh, you notice things about the way the world is going and you know you, those things kind of stay in your mind a bit more because it no longer just affects you. And, and the difficult thing for me was, was getting the right balance between business and home because it, it was suddenly there's so much going on at home now. How could I keep, keep our, our money flowing in that we need to live? And, you know, all, all these things become way more important because you're now responsible for, for this, this small human being who cannot look after themselves. And on that note, then, do you feel that you're, you've balanced? I know it's a very short amount of time because he's only five mm. months old, but have you found that balance between business working and spending as much time with your family that you need i would say i'm more balanced so in an ideal world i would have more time at home there's no doubt about that um but we have to make a deal with ourselves so you know so in my mind i think okay i'm going to work really hard in the week but i'm going to do it all within these hours so in those hours i i, I do way more now than i used to um then you ha then you have the time at the start and the end of each day to be with your family and also, you know, looking ahead and saying, right, let's plan what we're, we're going to do this year. So, you know, we're, we're going to go to France for a week and, you know, my son has American relatives. So we're going to go and spend a good amount of time in the U S as well. And those things matter so much now because it's, it's these only points in the year where you get to be a family together. Everything mm -hmm. else is evenings and mornings. And you're not, you know, life is like, they are always rushed. Yeah, I can imagine. And whereas certain things you may have put off uh, before you had your son, say, oh, I can do it later. It's not an issue now. I guess mm. it becomes a little bit more imminent and pressing. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Mm. On that note, Phil, it'd be very interested to hear for the dads out there, the men out there who may be becoming dads or even just men in general about your health. I know we talked about mm. this briefly beforehand, but uh, what are your, if you have any practices on keeping healthy or your thoughts on health in general mm. and also how that's now changed since you've had to your son. Sure. Well, I would say that you know, my physical fitness is not as good as it was a year ago. Without <laughs> um, That's despite lifting a baby every day and you're almost doing weight training every hour, right? When you're with your baby. <laughs> um, but but what, what I have tried to maintain is meditation every morning, uh, you know, enjoying walks with my dog and my son. Um, you might be able to hear my dog's ear shaking in the background there. He's with me today. And this, you know, enjoying Tai Chi, which again is a soft, a soft art, as, as you described it. 
And these things give me this space in my mind to build up the energy to get everything done in the day that I need to get done. So, you know, I, I, I find also that those are things you can almost do sometimes when a baby's around you, whereas it'd be much tougher to have loud music playing and, you know, doing a circuit, which is making lots of noise. It's, it's, uh, it's for me, this, the softer things that I try and bring into my life help bring down the energy in me as well. So I can be calmer, my mind's more open uh, and I can walk into every day relaxed. That's the key thing for me right now. Yeah, it sounds like you're, you're able to manage uh, your stress a lot better because obviously having a little one, and as you were saying earlier, before you're not sleeping many hours during mm. the night can be very stressful on the body, physiologically, uh, mentally, psychologically, and everything. So do you, would you say that has helped you to almost... Absolutely. Adapt? I actually feel if I go four or five days without meditating or without having the time to take that little time out for myself, I feel the difference. I'm more on edge, I'm more tense, I'm worried about things. Whereas just taking that, it sounds contradictory, when you're very busy, it's almost more important, I think, to take the time to meditate and have time out every day. Because it helps you manage that busyness in a a much better way. Yeah, because when you're more busy, you're more stressed, so you need it Mm. more than, than you ever do. On that note then, Phil, what advice would you give to people um, who are like us, I guess, other men out there who either run their own businesses, fellow entrepreneurs, or, or even busy professionals who have hectic schedules, maybe, as you say, parents and dads and, or have newborns to keep on top of their health or make it better? I think you have to take time out for yourself. You know, we're, we're, we like to think we're machines and that we can keep going without breaking and, and that, you know, we, we just have to keep forging on because that's the answer to getting to the destination in our minds but really like everything else in our lives we are the same we have to look after everything and nurture it you know nurture is a better way than demand and i think as guys we can find ourselves treating our own person more like a a racehorse in a in a a grand national race or you know something that we're just going to push to the end until it breaks so we have to nurture ourselves take that time out and allow ourselves to ground. That's what I find. It's like a feeling of coming down inside myself. Right, okay. Now I'm ready to take on the day because I found myself again. Whereas when we're so busy, we sort of lose our inner self, I believe. Yeah, so you've recentered, you slow down, you recalibrated, and then you, you go again. Yeah, that's it. That's, awesome. that's really, really helpful. So, with all this in mind, Phil, you've, you know, you've achieved quite a lot. But obviously you're going forward. You've got a new legacy, if you like, to, to leave behind and nurture within your, your son. What are your goals for the next one, three, five years, both business and personal? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to get us to a point where we can have a choice of where we want to live. So, you know, we, we spend time living in other countries. It's, it's a bit too cold here, Aiden, for my wife. Uh, so, I agree. <laughs> So, you know, we, we do have ambitions to maybe try life in France or Spain and getting ourselves in a position to do that is, is a big business aim. So it's not only financially, um, it's actually cheaper to buy property countries like that, but it's also having this setup where new business can come in, where things can run, where existing clients are, are not concerned by the fact that we're no longer in the country. All those things have to be thought through. Uh, you know, I want to spend more time with my son. That's, that's always the most valuable thing in my life that I want to aim for. And I want to take myself on a journey, I believe, where I learn more about myself. Because I think fatherhood does that too. It, it begins to bring out different parts of you, which you encounter and discover. So I want to explore that more and see where all of this can go. It's all about happiness. You know, that's what I've, I've learned in life. It's, we can pursue money, and that can maybe make us a bit, bit more content for a while. But, uh, but having loads of money does not bring happiness. It's, it's other things that do that. It's inner peace, really, that brings happiness. And whatever it is for any of us that brings that is what we should pursue. Yeah, and what do we do with that money? You know, it's, it takes us somewhere, but then, as you say, what opportunities will it provide you with? And if you use them well, then that's going to bring you that, that peace that you're, 
desiring. So definitely brilliant. On that note, Phil, just tell us a quick story about a time in your journey where you experienced an aha moment of realization. Sure. Um, a, a few years ago, uh, I kind of left an agency in the UK, which is very traditional. So it was city center based and we had staff and did uh, every aspect of marketing. And uh, I went to try life in other countries with my wife. So we started off in Argentina and went through Spain, Portugal, the USA and Ireland. And, you know, that journey really taught me how to run a business remotely. And that, that became the basis from which I created Positive Sparks. So Positive Sparks is a remote team. Uh, we have team members in France and in, even in the Philippines, the USA. Uh, and, and the great thing is, is everybody's living a life that motivates them. So they're, they're, the monies that they get from Positive Sparks enables them to live this, this kind of life abroad. Uh, when I started working remotely, it was kind of the early days of Skype. and We didn't have this notion of a digital nomad that we do now. So everything had to be learned through trial and error. You know, Aiden, we had power cuts in Argentina and the internet wasn't that great. So running a remote business through those circumstances really was a baptism of fire. But it resulted in really understanding how to build relationships when we're not there in person every day. And that moment for me was a huge aha moment because it meant that we could be anywhere. You know, I'm, I'm down in Cornwall now, which is in the UK but it is by far the best part of the UK I've lived in. You know, we've got beaches. We can walk to a beach from our house. Um, there's so much beauty around us. There's, there's a, a certain lifestyle choice to the people that live here. So everyone's here because it's a beautiful place to live. But everybody's here wanting to do great things with their businesses too. There's a hugely positive place to be. And wherever we do go next, I, I wanted to have some of that element, that culture within it. Um, but for me, that, that moment changed my life, that understanding that this is possible. And again, for me, it was early. So now there are lots of people with remote businesses. But, you know, I've, I've been doing this since 2008, so it's, it's a long time. Yeah, I'm, wow, yeah, I'm quite shocked. I didn't know you had such a remote team and also you'd worked in all those places along your journey. I, I assumed that you were more central where you are now. So that's really good to see that you did that when, as you say, it wasn't necessarily the norm or it wasn't proven to be possible yet. So totally. very, very yeah. interested. I'm conscious of time, but just to wrap up on a few other uh, questions, Phil is with those successes you've made, could you share with us a few personal habits or daily routines that have contributed and still do to your success? Sure. Well, I get up early. Um, 6 a.m., alarm goes off. This morning, Aiden, I was a bit naughty, stayed in bed till about 22 minutes past six, but <laughs> hey, we're allowed one of them every now and then. Um, first thing I do is meditate. Cup of coffee, actually, to be fair, is the first thing, then meditation. And then the next thing is, is a dog walk. Uh, my son comes if he's up. Uh, no phones, no email until we've, we've meditated, we've walked, we've enjoyed a coffee, sometimes a slice of toast. And then once... I get back, then we can let the day come to me. So the first tip there is control when the day arrives. Don't wake up to a notification. Wake up and do things for yourself. That is, that is the best time for me to have my me time. Um, then once the day is started and I get in the car and I drive to work, I play you know, some really cheesy, loud rock music or some of the indie bands that I was into when I was your age and younger. And that gets my kind of mood high and it gets my energy strong and so once I'm at work I'm ready to take on the day uh, first thing I do is I plan the day ahead see what's come in what do I need to do uh, it's we another tip for everybody out there is we have to do the most important thing first that's that's what I always put first on my list no matter how difficult it is uh, that makes the rest of the day go better and what we have to focus on are the things that are going to build our business. So there will always be lots of admin and hassle that will come our way. But try and control that and put it onto one day of the week. The rest of the time, we've got to work on the business and build it. Uh, I stop at six every day. Then I go home and that's my family time. 
Uh, I'm, I'm an online person, so you know I try every new app and tool out there. And anything that helps me be more efficient, I'll stick with. So pretty much everything I do, you know, runs from tools and apps that help me do things quicker. It sounds like you've nailed a lot of the productivity and efficiency and even more so since you've uh, had your little one. So those Definitely. are some great tips, that, uh, especially some of the apps and tools, which I can even take away. And one of the best things I've done recently is just switch all notifications off on my phone because I found I was just getting hundreds and it was just, can't deal with it. It's too much, too many distractions, not allowing you to focus. I agree. I agree. And you say it's so much about how successful we are it comes down to how much time we have to focus on the most important things. And you can lose your life to notifications and other people's problems. You really can. Yeah, it's taken away from your time. And imagine evolutionary speaking, it would be like imagine having all those people around you shouting at you, saying something to you. It would be mm. yeah, yeah, really bad. Totally. On that note, Phil, what is your strategy and or strategies for success? Uh, we touched on this a bit earlier on. I think it's better to be exceptional at one or two things rather than good at many. Uh, go where there is space. So, you know, right now we have a craze on Bitcoin and crypto trading, and that's wonderful. But uh, just be aware the more people that come into that market, the less opportunity exists. Let's be good people. Be gracious to everyone. Uh, I do believe that you give good energy out, it will come back. And, you know, one thing I've learned to do, Aiden, which I've learned to do much later than you in life, uh, so you've got an advantage here, is the ability to listen not only to our logic, but to our heart and our gut as well. It's a really, really difficult thing to do because I think we're almost brought up to ignore our heart and ignore our gut, and just go with logic. Um, be brave, step outside of your comfort zone. Uh, I've always learned the most from failure and I try to remember that when it's happening. Yeah, when it doesn't sound so sweet, <laughs> try to remember, well, it's worth it in the long run. Totally. Awesome. And with that in mind, what's your best success? today um probably the best time for me was uh 2010 early days of pay-per-click again i was in early i had an agency at the time and i also had a suite of hotel booking sites so i had um fee that i was charging for my time but then i also had this other business which was generating um ongoing income which was not dependent on the time i put in so that combination of fees and daily commissions resulted in the most money I've ever made. Um, alongside that, I think Positive Sparks being a truly remote agency and operating uh, in, in a really positive way that clients love and we love is, is the, the most wonderful human side of business I've, I've managed to create. So, you know, to create a team of real people living real business and, and, and having personal relationships through this wonderful thing of the digital world is, is something I'm really proud of. Awesome. That sounds really, really interesting. A lot we can learn from that as well, Phil. Um, I'm conscious of your time. Shall we wrap up or do you have time for one or two more questions? Go for two more. I've just got someone waving at me saying the next people are going to be 10 minutes late anyway. Okay, cool. All right, let's do that. <laughs> so let's uh, go particularly to the, uh, the main questions then. So for our male audience, what issues do you see that men should be thinking and or acting about or on? So what should men be doing in the world as such? Effectively. Yeah. yeah so, so I think we can, you know, we have this thing of masculinity and we'll, we'll see it manifest in so many different ways. And some of those ways are positive and some are negative. And there's, it's only yours. It's only, it's our responsibility to be positive human beings. And that's whether we're male or female or, or, or whatever we are, we, we, we have to make the world a better place just by our presence. So, you know, I, I think that as guys, we have to look at that every day. You know, what have I done today that maybe I shouldn't have done? You know, what was I rude to people? Uh, was I aggressive to people? Um, and, if, and if we are, why did we do that? How can we do it different next time? If, if every guy on the planet is a positive guy then how much better would the world be yeah so self-awareness and having that constructive criticism upon our own selves rather than having to wait for others to totally Brilliant. definitely and with that in mind then what advice do you give to the younger generation of boys who are coming up and potentially turning into young men maybe like myself but also maybe looking at even someone 
like your son as they're growing up? What advice would you have to boys? Well, I, I, you know, when I think about my son growing up, you know, that I think of positive role models and I think of my own in my life and the ones I did have and the ones I didn't have. So one of my aims for his life is to find him positive role models and also positive ways of expressing what he has. So we're all different. And, uh, you know, I believe whatever gifts we have can be sent a positive way or a negative way. So, you know, I, I feel I'm quite good with words and I can write beautiful things down and make people feel good. Or I can, I can write not so beautiful things down and make people feel bad. It's a positive and negative kind of outcome from that. You know, you yourself, Aiden, you're a big martial artist and a martial art is great because it's a positive channel for aggression and for strength and for combat. Whereas we can also see the negative side when we you know, put on the TV and there's been a, a problem at a football match or there's violence at some point in the world. There's, there's this duality to everything that we have. Um, so I would say look for things that you can do that make you feel good inside, where you're doing what you're good at, and people who can guide you to be even better at what you're good at. And what a better time to start than when you're young. Because if you don't start there, totally. you, you don't see it happening much later on, do you? You don't. No, it's very hard to change yeah. when we're already set in our ways. Exactly. Phil, last thing then is, is there anything else you want to mention? Uh, tell us any projects or you're working on, anything like that. And also, please share links to your website, social media, and where our listeners can find you. Sure. Uh, well, we've just launched a new website at www.positivesparks.com. Uh, you can log on there and claim three free tips on how pay-per-click can help your business grow. Check out our podcast. It's called Positively Sparking. You can search it on iTunes or any of the major podcast directories. Uh, you can contact me on Twitter. I'm Positive Sparks on Twitter. And on LinkedIn, just search for Phil T. Byrne. Uh, I'd love to hear from you all. Happy to answer any questions you have. And most of all, I hope you enjoy Aiden's podcast and become the positive guys he's hoping to help you become. Phil, thank you so much. I just want to really, really thank you for you being here today, sharing your wisdom, your knowledge, and also your precious time. And as you say here at Fit Roots, we are here to build modern warriors. So thank you for contributing to that. Phil, I'll see you soon. Thank you, Aiden.